Hey, that's good. That, is that new, John? I don't think I've heard that before. Yeah, amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Megan, for blessing us today. Encouraging song unto our soul. Take your Bible. Go to Romans chapter 12. We are uh, continuing our study and preaching through the book of Romans. Uh, we did this years ago, a little more verse by verse. And now we're kind of going a little paragraph by paragraph, taking a little overview of the book of Romans. We did that uh, at the end of last year, and then we took a break through uh, Christmas, first year, and then, of course, Proverbs, and now we come back. We're to chapter 12 today, and this is a normal break in the book of Romans. Uh, as you read through it, you'll find uh, Romans 1 through 8 is the doctrinal side. Paul digs down into the doctrine of redemption and Christ. And then in chapters 9, 10, and 11, uh, he deals with the history and the future of Israel, where we preached about Israelology uh, just a few weeks ago. And then as we come to chapter 12 through 16, he moves into what some would call, and I agree, a more practical application of living out the doctrine that is found in the first eight chapters. And so we come today to a turnstile text taking doctrine and turning it to practicality uh, in our life. Now, be very careful in your Christian life. Some people are doctrinal folk. They just like to go down deep, stay down long, and come up dry. All right? Now, there's nothing wrong with going down deep and staying long. But you better come up soaking wet in the Holy Ghost if you're going to practice what you're talking about. Some people just like to live in doctrine, all right? Amen. On the other side, some people will ignore the doctrine, and it's just about what do I do day by day by day? Well, blessed are the balanced, all right? You, you need the truth as well as that that is applicable unto our life day by day. Day. And so Paul has talked about the doctrine of Christ and the spirit life and now how do we work that out and he's going to show us many ways of practicality but this morning there is what I call the key the very key to victory that comes as we are working out that that God has placed in us so Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 you follow along many of you will already know this text of course it is a classic text in the book of Romans. Chapter 12, verse 1 and verse 2, you follow along as I read because this now is the word of our great God. Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. As we dive in to chapter 12, we are running straight toward Easter Sunday eight weeks from now. We are headed to Easter, coming early the last Sunday of March. And as we do, we'll be finding the spirit life in the book of Romans. Now, friend, you have to decide how you're going to live your faith walk. And you're going to live it in one of three ways. You're either going to live it with a sensual emphasis, with a soulish emphasis or a spiritual emphasis. And here's what I mean by that. There are a lot of people who live their life in the sensual. That is, they are ruled by their physical senses. Their touch, their sense, their smell, taste. They, they uh, run their life in a sensual way. Some people move past that to what I would call a soulish emphasis. That's your mind, your will, your emotion. All of these things are important in our life. All of our senses, uh, what you feel is very important. Your mind, your will, your emotion, all of that 
It's an essential part. But the way you ought to live your life is not with the sensual ruling your life, not being ruled by your mind, will, and emotion. You need to be ruled by the Spirit of the living God. The Spirit of God should rule in your life. And that is where Paul is headed here when he talks about presenting your bodies, which is the spiritual service of worship. And I got two things I want you to see. I put them up on the board here for you. Number one, don't, don't miss this. The key to spiritual victory is not trying to get all we can from God, but in giving all that we are to God. It's not trying to get everything you can from him, but it's giving everything that you are to him. That's key to spiritual victory in your life. It's not to receive. It is to give of your life. Oswald Chambers, in uh, is my utmost for his highest, when he writes about this verse, and he does on several of his devotionals, uh, Dr. Chambers said it this way. There is actually only one thing you can dedicate to God. I love this. And that one thing is your right to yourself. You give the right of your own self unto God. Lord, I'm not mine. I've been bought with the price. Lord, I, I don't own me. I give my right of myself. I dedicate that unto you. And friend, when you come to grow into that way, you're going to begin to find greater victory in your life, greater depth and greater reach and power within your life. So how do we do this? Well, I want to give us three practical application share a story with you and then give a gospel invitation for you to come put your life in this church put your life in Christ come and some of us to present our bodies unto the Lord how do we do this well number one the first thing you've got to do is be sure of your own salvation now I, I don't know everybody I'm talking to on a Sunday morning. I certainly don't know everybody I'm talking to uh, that uh, watches this broadcast, uh, who some tune in live and some will see it later, some next Saturday, uh, as we'll be here to our friends that are on the Warrington campus. I, I don't know all of those people. As a matter of fact, on this particular thing, I don't need to worry about anybody but the preacher. Are you sure of your salvation? I mean, friend, if you were to die today, do you know 100% heaven be your home? In this text, he said, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God. Friend, you can't get saved any way except by the mercy of God. You don't deserve heaven. You don't deserve forgiveness. You deserve hell. I deserve hell. Our life is that that is going against God. But thank the Lord for mercy. He has shown mercy unto us. And Paul says it best, I think, in Titus chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, where he said, But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us. Not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his, say that word out loud, mercy. According to his mercy by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. That's how God saves you. This was Eddie Ashari's favorite verse. Matter of fact, it's on his tombstone. Ephesians 3, 4, 5, and 6. Our dear friend here, many of you wouldn't even know him, but uh, came here years ago and began to lead our drug and alcohol recovery program after God had changed his life. This was his key text for, for living, that God by his mercy, that's how he saved us. God stooped and, and loved you and cared for you. 
Friend, you don't dare walk out of this building today unless you know that you know you know that your name's written in the book of life, that God has loved you. It's nothing you do. I can't do it. You can't do it. God did it. It's mercy, mercy, mer Thank God for mercy. <laughs> Hallelujah. Put that verse back up there again, Becca. Go back. I, just, just look at this one more time. Verse 3. He, he saved us, not on the basis. See, a lot of people say, well, now, I, you know, if I give enough money or I do it. Friend, your deeds will land you in hell. It's mercy. Some say that, no, he doesn't save us on the basis of the deeds we've done, right? Just, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration, he cleanses you from all of that stuff that's in you. Thank God he washed it away, amen? Oh, what a savior. And friend, if you come running to him today, he'd save you. He'd save you. Say, Pastor, you don't know what I've done. You ought to read the first chapter of Matthew. You say, well, that's, that's the genealogy chapter. Yeah, that's the genealogy chapter. You'll find four ladies mentioned in there that were part of the lineage of Jesus. They didn't have good backgrounds. That's why he mentioned them. Bathsheba. Ruth, non-Jew. Oh, my. David had some. Well, it was not easy. He was a Moabite. You'll find those ladies are mentioned not because of their beginning of godliness, but their ungodliness. And God reached and saved them by his mercy and washed them, forgave them. And they gave us Jesus. Friend, if you'd get saved today, you're home watching on television, you're sitting in that Warrington campus there. If, if you don't know, I'm telling you, God loves you and by his mercy. I, I don't give a rip what you've done. You can be the biggest sinner you can ever think. Just make up stuff. I'm here to tell you, it's under his blood. You won't find anybody in the world treat you like Jesus. Friend, he loves you, and by his mercy, he washes all of that away. Glory to God, what a Savior. Friend, you'll never loathe the spirit life until you are sure of your salvation. And when you get that square, and you get that certain, and you know, then you're ready for this passage to become reality in your life. So, if you've never been saved, let's just stop right here on television. On a warranty. Let, let's just stop, right? Let's just ask God. I'm going to thank him for saving me years ago. And if you've never asked Jesus to say, I want you just to ask him right now. Right in the middle of this sermon, I want you to ask Jesus. Let's just bow our head. If you're saved, thank God for it. If you're not, call on him right now. Father, I want to thank you when I was a 10-year-old boy that Nolan Ford shared with me the merciful plan of salvation. And I believe. And I was saved and regenerated. Lord, I pray for friends right now in this room, television, Warrington, other places, that, Lord, are calling on you right now. Thank you for the promise that if we will call, you will save. If we would but receive, that you'd change us. So, oh, God, step out of heaven, step into hearts today. I pray people be born again right now, saved, and if they'd make that known this day. And I ask you and thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, if you've prayed to receive Christ, I want you to tell me about it after church today. I'm going to give an invitation. I'm going to stand right here. I want you to just walk down here and tell me. If you're on that warranty campus, I want you to come. If you're at home, send me a text or an email or something. Uh, you can get it to us. Write us a letter. Uh, just come to church next Sunday and tell me. That'd be a great thing. Maybe you live off somewhere. Just write us and let us know that you've trusted Christ. Listen, friend, the key to victory begins with knowing that you know you've got to be sure of your salvation. But now he says, after you're sure of your salvation, you must present your body. This is just an odd, odd thing to me. That you come by mercy for salvation, but then you present your bodies. And he uses this Old Testament uh, overarching illustration if you will you you bring a living sacrifice you, you don't bring a dead animal you you bring a live animal and you don't bring one that's got 
problem. You don't bring one that's not pure. You don't pick one up that's lame. You, you bring the lamb. And it's holy. And it's acceptable. And this is your spiritual service. Well, today we don't give lambs and doves. You give yourself. You, you present your body as a living, holy, acceptable sacrifice. I want you to look at three verses of scripture with me about the body. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse number 20. For you've been bought with a price. Therefore, what are you supposed to do in your body? Glorify. That's the first. You, you bring, you present yourself. You, you come in glory, glory unto God. And you let God through you then be glorified in your body. Bring your body and, and as you give it to God, you become a vessel for the glory of God to be in you and through you. Then look at 2 Corinthians 4 and verse number 10. Always caring about in the body the dying of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be, what's that word? Manifested in our body. Amen. Manifest. First verse, glorify. Then manifest. Jesus is to manifest himself in it, but you've got to give yourself to him. So that the glory of God comes and the manifestation of Jesus comes through your life. Come, present your body. Then thirdly, once you Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 20. Mm, 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 mm. According to my earnest expectation and hope, look at this. I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness is always that he would be, what's the word? exalted in my body whether I exalt him by my living or my dying living glorified living manifested and then living that Jesus is exalted it's about him it's not about you he's the one supposed to get the praise glory 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 manifested through us that our life is lived not for ourselves but lived for Jesus we are to give ourselves as an offering. All right, now watch this. I'll be back, camera. Hang on. All right, we give an offering. It's good that you give your money. I'm all for that. You've known me that well. All right, I'm, I'm for this. But let me tell you what belongs in this plate today. You. you. You got to put you in here. Your money's not worth a dime to get you in here. I wasn't there. I wish I would have been. In an African nation, a missionary shared the story, and I've told it many times, and I've read it. He preached on giving your all. And in that particular church they put the offering receptacles down at the bottom and people came by and marched by and they put their offering in and he said when the offering was over that day a little boy was about eight or nine years old said he came and he said I don't have anything and he said the little boy stepped over in the offering bucket and said all I got's me and I give myself that is Romans 12, 1 and 2. Present your body a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable unto God. It's your reasonable service, your spiritual service. That, that's your worship. See, when you come in here, sing, give yourself, but not just here, everywhere you are, do it. Present yourself so that he can be glorified, so that he can be manifested, that he can be exalted in your life. We'll put those back when we get ready for next service. Put yourself at God's disposal. Amen? Yes. That is the key. Number one, be sure, be sure of your own salvation. 
Number two, present your body. Surrender. Paul Nagrud in Romania told me years ago when I asked him, I said, Dr. Nagrud, what is the difference in Christianity under communism and the Christianity I know in America? He said, oh, it's easy, Pastor. He said, your churches talk about commitment. Our churches talk about surrender. You just want to help God. We don't have anything but God. So we don't commit things, we surrender things. Giving all under. Commitment's not a bad word unless you've never come to surrender. Because surrender is where it all begins. What's the key? Be sure of your salvation. Present your body. And then he says, thirdly, to be transformed. Look at it in verse number two. And do not be conformed to this world. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. We're going to preach about that next Sunday. And and how you renew your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. That that comes in your life after you're sure of your salvation, you've presented your body, then a great transformation comes in your life. And that transformation is that you begin to live the will of God. You don't live your will. You don't live your mama's will. You don't live a friend. You live God's will. And when you do, transformation starts coming. It's the process of sanctification. Well, what's the will of God? Well, number one, the will of God is you get saved. It's the will of God after you get saved, you're baptized. You know, there are a lot of people in the church never been baptized after they got saved. They're They've got a blockage in in their spiritual vein. It's the will of God that you love those that have done you wrong. It's the will of God that you forgive those that hurt you. It's the will of God you tell others about Jesus. It's the will of God you be a part of a church. When you know the will of God, do it. Your mind is, you know what to do, and then you just, have you ever known what you ought to do and you just couldn't do it? Well, let me tell you, when you take a step, God begins to bring this victory in your life. There's transformation. I want to share my spiritual walk with you for this week I stood here and preached last Sunday two services came back that night and ordained five deacons got up on Monday morning at 7 o'clock and drove 120 miles to graceful Florida met all day long with the trustees of the Florida Baptist University Finished dinner in the president's new house, had a great evening, got in my car and drove back. Got home about 8 o'clock on Monday night, tired, preaching all day Sunday, driving, spending all day. Came in, sat down, took my shoes off, and about a half hour later, my phone rang. I looked down and it said the residence. I said, that's where mama lives. I said, they don't ever call at night. Something must be up. Florine was on the line. I'd never met Florine. I'd never been to the residence at night. I'd never had to go over there in the evening. She said, Pastor Trailer. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, your mother's not doing well tonight. I said, well, thanks for the call. I said, do you think I ought to come? She said, yes, sir, I think you ought to come here. (laughs) Well, I knew what that meant. When When a hospice nurse calls you at night and tells you you ought to come, you better get in your car and go. Liz looked at me and said, you want me to go with you? I said, yeah, I really do. So we got in the car and made our way over. Mother was really struggling. And when she started struggling, I was struggling. And 
I didn't know what to do. And I kept coming back to this passage, Lord, I, I just, show me, show me. She had that old death rattle in her heart, in her throat. And they called in the other upgrade of the hospice nurse. He came. He said, I think we better get a little morphine, put on her tongues, that'll relax her throat, and she'll feel better. I said, Pastor, what's this got to do with this passage? This has got everything to do with this passage. This is my spiritual walk this week. I can either walk in the flesh or the strength of the Holy Ghost. And everybody left out of the room because she sounded awful. I pulled up a chair. I got out my phone. I didn't have my Bible with me. And I turned to the book of Ruth. That's mama's favorite book. I said, Mother, I'm going to read Ruth to you. Eyes closed, laying over, and just kind of drooling and looking for short, shortness of breath. So I started through Ruth. After the time of the judges, there came a famine in the land. And Naomi and Elimelech left Bethlehem to go to Moab. Their two sons were with them, puny and pitiful. That's what their names mean. Lord, whatever you do, don't name your boy puny or pitiful, all right? They got to Moab, they found Moabite women, they married them. One married Orpah and one married Ruth. And then Elimelech died, and puny and pitiful died. Naomi just left with two girls. Now, I'm reading this to Mother, it's her favorite book. And of course, Orpah, when Naomi starts back to Bethlehem, said, y'all go back to your mom and daddy and Orpah says, I will. Ruth said, oh, no, no, no. Wherever you go, I'm going. Wherever you stay, I stay. Wherever you God is, my God, I'm, I'm with you. She said, okay. And, of course, Ruth goes with her. The longer I read into chapter 2, Mother started just settling a little bit. Breathing got a little better. I read in chapter 3, and the nurse came back in, stopped through chapter 3, and told me they were going to go get that medicine. I said, okay, do whatever you want to. They ordered it. If I ever heard the Holy Ghost, he said, she'll never take that medicine. She'll be gone to heaven before they get here with the order. I kept reading chapter 3. <laughs> Boaz shows up. The old kinsman redeemer. He's not first in line. You know, he has to let the other guy go first. He's going to inherit the land. He said, I want to do that. He said, well, Ruth comes with it. And Naomi said, oh, I ain't in for that. And we'll have enough for that. Boaz said, I'll take it. Of course, he and Ruth then get married. We're reading into chapter 4. Boaz takes Ruth and after they get married, they have a baby. His name's Obed. Obed in Hebrew means the servant of God. Of course, Obed will later grow up and get married. He and his wife have a little boy, and his name be Jesse. And Jesse will grow up, and he'll get married, and he and his wife will have a little boy. His name's King David. Ruth, the non-Jew is the grandmother of the psalmist. God would take a crooked stick and draw a straight line. God would take that that we think is not much and make it happen. God would take you. If you'd quit thinking you are something and come to understand the zero you are and come to God, he may make a thousand out of you. I just kept reading. I got to the end, read all those hard names at the end of Ruth. A 
when I finished, in a few minutes, my mother raised her head up off the pillow. Brother Eric, she drove those eyes to me and she looked at me. She didn't smile. I mean, she didn't leave my eyes for 20 good seconds. And that's a long time when nobody's saying anything. She just stared at me with her eyes as wide open as ever I've seen. I reached over and patted her on the shoulder. I said, Mother, you can go when you're ready. She laid her head back down. In about 15 minutes, she stepped into the arms of Jesus. About 15 minutes later, they came in with morphine. I said, just put it here on my tongue. I, be... <laughs> I said, no, you probably ought to save that for somebody else. We, we're going to be all right. Miss Florine came in. You tell that lady how good she is. Came in with a stethoscope. She said, yeah, Pastor, she's gone. I said, I know. <laughs> you don't know what you're going to face this week. I didn't have a clue what I was going to face this week. I've done three funerals this week. Sherry Trail, you said right down here, had one of the largest funerals we've had in quite some time here. Dr. Passmore and I did it. Another funeral on Thursday, then get in the car and drive to the mountain. Mother's viewing. People came through here Thursday night. You loved on us so much. We preached yesterday. One of our deacons came and said, Pastor, you're not going to drive home. I'm driving you home. He wouldn't let me drive my car. He said, you're too tired. He took my keys and drove me here. Me and my wife. That's what a deacon does. Friend, I didn't know what I was going to face, but I'm here to tell you I couldn't face it without the power of the Holy Ghost in my life. I couldn't do it. Only God does. So I, I'm, I'm imploring you today to present your body a living sacrifice unto God. I don't know what you're going to face this week. But whatever it is, you can't do it without the power of God in your life. And if you think you can, then all they're going to get you. And what this world needs is the manifestation and the exaltation and the glorification, not of us, but of King Jesus through us. So they came and got her. And as they rolled mother out, my wife looked at me. She said, well, we're next. I said, I'm not next. You can go. I ain't going. <laughs> you don't know who's next. Amen. Amen. As I shared at that funeral Saturday, after Mama met Jesus and everybody else, I, just in my own imagination, want to believe that a little Moabite woman walked up to her and said, Gene, my name's Ruth. I hear you like my story. Can I just show you around heaven? We got a little while. We're going to be here for a good while. I don't know what happened. But I like to believe Ruth found time to tell my little Alabama mama 
that the same way God used her, he used a Moabite woman that was a zero. Nothing. But God reached through the kinsman redeemer. I shared that with a buddy of mine, and he said, Pastor, you know what happened in that room, don't you? I said, well, I don't know. You may have a word. He said, when you got done, the same kinsman redeemer that came to get Ruth came to get your mama and took her to the other side. I've learned more about heaven this week than ever I've known in my life. I've had my eyes on heaven. Dear friend, you ought to present your body a living sacrifice unto God so that whatever it is comes your way. God will give you strength. I'd never planned to read the book of Ruth in all my life to my mother. And I believe I heard the Spirit of God whisper that into my soul that night, sitting there all by myself. Everybody else went out of the room. They don't have nothing to do with it. And Flo came in a little while later, and she said, You know, Pastor, she was just waiting to hear your voice and say it's all right. I said, I believe that, Miss Florine. I really do. I believe that's the truth. The last voice she ever heard was this. But oh my Lord, the first voice she heard over yonder Welcome home, my sister. You're absent from your body and you're present with your Lord. Enter into the joy of God's salvation.